ask the uh, organizers uh, for opportunity to speak because I said like Chicken Little, I think the specialty is going to die and I'm going to call my talk the demise of thoracic surgery and, the, and I want to do the Tudor Ellis lecture and they, and they said to me, look, whatever you're snorting, stop it. <laughs> and secondly, we want a real superstar to do the Tudor Ellis lecture, like Surf, not you. So I'm here, stuck with a three-part series and this is the first of my three-part series, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. You know, I've got a background in uh, statistics. I also uh, am a chief investigator for Violet, as well as Mars 2. I like to do some horizon scanning from now, now and then. And I'm coming back to you about things which I feel may be perceived as a threat to our specialty going forwards. So, first of all, congratulations. Since the advent of thoracic surgery, we have never, ever been challenged as a supreme standard of care for early stage lung cancer ever, right? Unprecedented, unparalleled, never. But all partying has to come to an end the next morning, <laughs> all right? And this party came to an end, in my opinion, in 2015, when the results of two trials amalgamated together for the very first time, showing that radiotherapy was associated with a statistically significant improvement to survival compared to surgery in a randomized trial. This is level one evidence. How many of you in the audience speak to your patients about this uh, trial before you consent them for surgery? Hands up. This trial, it's a trial. It's an individual, okay, so less than 1%. So basically, this is what's happening. Those of us who know about the trial are not wanting to, to look at the trial results. You don't want to believe it, and you don't want to synthesize it. Understand that on the opposite side, the radiation oncologists, the, all the um, govern, governments, policy funding bodies are looking at this at, as we speak to determine what is the best practice for the country. Ultimately, this trial worries me because it's an example of hard evidence. It's hard evidence. Death is a very objective outcome. Achieving statistical significance with such small numbers implies a very big magnitude of treatment effect, i.e. this is worrying. With regards to the soft outcome, Sabre compared to an operation is you go into this donut, you have some light shone on you, and then that's it. You go home. Awesome. That's really cool. So if you don't believe in the hard outcome, it improves your survival with the soft outcome saying that nobody's going to stick a knife into you and tear your insides out. Why would they want that? Go into the machine, have a bit of radiation, off you go. But what's happening next? MR Linac. Have you heard of that? I haven't quite heard of that either. So you know what a, a linear accelerator is, right? Like they use in CERN when they look for particle physics, where they have this massive, big underground donut that accelerates particles to produce the actual radiation. And they're going to incorporate that with magnetic resonance imaging so that they can track the tumor movement when they give the radiotherapy. So as we speak, in the underground, the top right picture is, I believe, the Christie Hospital in Manchester, where they are building uh, UK's MR Linac facilities. And in the bottom is the Royal Martin Hospital in London, where the first two MR Linacs are going to be situated in the United Kingdom. And basically, the actual power of this is to not only enhance Sabre, but actually use it in real time tumor tracking so that they can. Uh, to allow them to give uh, less radiation to the normal lung, which implies that they are able soon to give even more radiation to the abnormal lung without causing any side effects. But that in itself doesn't quite worry me so much. This, I think, becomes even more important. This venture is backed by multi-billion dollar companies. And if you go onto the website, it says, Electa and Philips will make MR Linac a reality. And you can imagine that they will. Because you know why? They're going from a what? 1, 2% space of the 20% of early lung cancer. They're going from there all the way up to 20. That's their aim. They're starting from ground zero. So why wouldn't they encroach on this space? And in order to do that, they're going to engage all the top clinical oncologists in the world, 
in an mRNA consortium, and the mission of which is to demonstrate that the technology will lead to improve patient outcomes for existing radiation therapy and extend the radiation therapy with new treatment techniques, which then lead to more indications, i.e., they're going to steal the food off your plate. <laughs> All right? That's what it means to me. When I read that, that's what I read. Are you depressed enough? No. National Proton Therapy Program. The United, uh, United Kingdom's government has pledged $250 million to build two proton beam facilities in the country by 2018. Again, one in the Christie, which I gave a talk two weeks ago, and as you enter the Christie Hospital, you see our proton beam being built in big signposts. And then another one is going to be built in UCL in London. Furthermore, they're going to engage research proton beam therapy at Oxford University, supported both by the UK government and by Cancer Research UK. Proton Partners International announced a £100 million bid to build centres in London, Cardiff and Newcastle. And two more companies in London at the Harley Street Clinic and Morgate will be opened by 2017. So what is this uh, proton uh, beam therapy? Well, in essence, it's a form of radiation therapy that allows even less radiation to the, ap uh, to the normal lung tissue. So compared to the blue lines, the IMRT, Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, you can, the actual exposure to normal tissue is going to be much less with proton beam therapy. And this is a, a, a reference that's not actually in press yet. It's uh, waiting to be published, and that's how uh, recent this horizon scanning is being done. Another paper also published this year gives you an indication of how the proton beam therapy um, movement is moving ahead. On the blue histogram are the actual clinical trials in place and the various subtypes, and lung is listed down as a fourth. So approximately 15 clinical trials at the moment on proton therapy, beam therapy in lung cancer. And on the black histogram is the number of, in thousands of patients who are actually receive this treatment going forward. And finally, the rightmost graph shows the number of proton beam therapy machines being installed worldwide. And you can see the exponential growth of the proton beam therapy as it actually increases. So why are surgeons disadvantaged? Because we refuse to look at evidence. We deny the research findings of our competitors rather than looking at them head to head and addressing it. Another issue, I think, is that we are refusing to engage with industry. And if you think that the radiation oncologists are being backed by a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, what are we doing about it? We can't just sit back comparing one stapler to another, to a different optic. The actual blue, gra blue plot doesn't increase. It continues to decrease. If you really want to take on industry, you need to actually take on the actual, the red bars, which is the in my opinion, cancer stage. Another thing is that we refuse to evolve. The indications and extent of surgery, what we do, has been the same all over again because we thought that we would never be at threat. And here's what happened to the last species who thought they would never be at threat because we don't actually see them anymore. Having said that, I also think that surgeons have a distinct advantage because surgery has a stellar reputation and a very long establishment. Competing innovations tend to take a long time to reach the market, so there is some time now. And I think that the most important fact is that patients' opinions matter. And with surgery, we have the ability or the perception that the cancer can be removed completely out of your body. So you might say, why is this guy standing up here who's always going on evidence-based, evidence-based, now talking about patient preference, patient preference, patient preference? Because don't forget, in the cardiac surgery setting, where there are numerous trials showing that left main disease, triple vessel disease, has superior survival when you undergo coronary artery bypass grafting, still the PCI rates shot up despite level 1A evidence proved demonstrating superior survival advantage. And that's because I don't think, well, cardiologists have always been to blame. I don't think it's the cardiologist, it's the patient. 
if you tell a patient, I'm going to do a minimally invasive intervention through a groin, on the downside, your survival won't be as long. I believe that patients are still choosing that in preference of having your breastbone sawed open, your heart stopped, heart-lung machine, and then restart your heart. Just think about that. In conclusions, I would say that we're witnessing an unprecedented acceleration in the advances of competing radiation technology. It's backed by multi-billion dollar industry. It's backed by the UK government. It demonstrates exponential growth with collaboration of an international top class research consortia. There is already randomized control trial evidence of superior survival for radiotherapy in early stage lung cancer. Whereas the practice of thoracic surgery has largely remained static, perhaps with the exception of bat lobectomy, based on patient pre preference, which is a tradition. However, the advantages we have are single point of treatment, complete resection, including molecular information. Part two of this talk will be tomorrow at 11.30 on the Violet Study. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about what we are doing in this country to uh, uh, address this on a head-to-head -head basis. Thank you very much.